Hey GBA fans, it's Choice CJ here, back to bring you another episode of Game of the Week, followed by our gl weekly glimpse into our crystal ball as we discuss the season end awards. Now, this week I am going solo as Aster has been promoted to the power rankings, but we should have a co-host joining in the near future, and when that time comes we will also have some more guests joining the show, whether they be analyst coaches or anyone else, since this is meant to be a debate and discussion video after all. So things are going to be just a little different this week, but I hope you guys enjoy it all the same. Now, after we saw a handful of nail-biting games in week one, I would say that week two took a complete 180 <laughs> compared to the previous week, because most of the games were really one-sided. Uh, we saw the first 6-0 victory of Season 7, shout out to Crimson. And uh, we even saw a uh, special guest appearance for Hoodlum Scrafty. He tagged out and brought in Maximilian Pegasus to predict the hell out of Battle Rax's every move. So while those games were certainly entertaining, it made it kind of difficult for me to choose a game of the week because I like to choose the games that have a lot of back and forth and you're not really sure who's going to win until the very end. Ultimately, I decided to highlight the game between the San Jose Sharpedos and the Utah Jasmine because, after all, it was a pretty close game, it was only a 2-0, and it did have some tense moments. And second off, Tom, who we affectionately refer to as everyone's favorite dumpster fire, actually deserves some high praise for how he played this game, so he's due sir, for his 15 minutes of glory. Cooper packed a lot of threats this week. The choice spec swallow that he brought could fire off boom bursts that were completely unresisted by Tom's team, and unfortunately for Tom, his Vaporeon used Roar twice, and twice he brought in that Swellow. It was definitely nice to get the Rocks damage off on the Swellow, and uh, it would have even been better if the Swellow was the Flame Orb set, because all that residual damage would add up over time. But unfortunately, every time the Swellow came in, Tom was basically forced to sack something. The first time, he sacked off his Nidoqueen, Queen, and then the second time, the he didn't actually have to lose a Pokemon, but his Vaporeon took some really critical damage and the Scrafty was able to come in on the next turn and revenge it. Because the Vaporeon was pretty crippled at that point, I was thinking that he was going to be in a tough spot because Vaporeon took on most of Cooper's team, except for probably Zapdos and maybe the Swellow that it had just revenged. Uh, it was also the best answer that Tom had to Calm Mind Reuniclus, uh, except for Knock Off on Hitmonlee, because it did have that roar and it could prevent the Reuniclus from setting up. This really sets up the most pivotal plays in this match, and they take place on two of the next three turns. Tom brought in a Choice Garf Gardevoir on the Scrafty that had just revenge killed the Vaporeon, as funny as that sounds, and Tom makes a really bold play and goes for Trick. He was banking on the Spideff Reuniclus coming in, and indeed that's exactly what Cooper sends in. So the Reuniclus now has a Choice Scarf, and a huge threat had just become neutered. That being said, I think the play that came next was even more important. The Reuniclus ended up locking itself into Shadow Ball, and Cooper switches out his Reuniclus into Scrafty. Now this seems like a perfectly reasonable play because Tom's Porygon 2 seems like the obvious switch in. But Tom predicted Cooper's prediction and switched out his Gardevoir not into Porygon, but into Hitmonlee. And as Tom will tell you, his Hitmonlee is not offensive, and because it's not offensive, nothing on Cooper's team can take either two high jump kicks or the combination of high jump kick and knockoff. So bringing in the Hitmonlee allowed him to net a kill either on that Scrafty or whatever he, Cooper wanted to send in. Cooper chooses to send in the Reuniclus. It dies to the high jump kick plus knockoff, and the game is tied up 4-4. Four to four. After that series of plays, Cooper's game plan kind of unraveled, unfortunately. He overpredicted versus the Hitmonlee and got his Hippout onto a KO'd. He popped the Yachi Berry on the Thunderous and got his Cloister killed, and funnily enough, because the Thundee had now had no item, the knockoff from Scrafty was not enough to take it out, and the Scrafty got killed by the Thundee. Eventually, Cooper was left with nothing but Zapdos, which was my early pick for defensive mod of the season, and I still think it's got a strong case. The Zapdos could have potentially stalled out the P2 and the Gardevoir that remained on Tom's side, but Charge Beam Porygon 2 was having none of that, <laughs> which is a really fun set, and Tom was able to walk away from the game with a 2-0 victory. At Team Breview, I definitely thought the game could have gone either way. The game was pretty winnable for Cooper, I think, with mons like Calm Mind Reuniclus and Zapdos to potentially turn into win cons. 
and I thought that he played really well, but Tom just played even better. He played really fantastic, and I'm sure that he's relieved to be in the win column much sooner than he had been in Season 6. With all that said, what game did you guys think was the best of Week 2? Make sure you leave your response down in the comments below. And now we're going to switch gears and take a very early look at Offensive Mon and Defensive Mon of the season, as well as Coach of the season. As we mentioned before, it's really hard to make some judgments on who's going to be winning these awards when we've only had two weeks of games take place, but we can make some speculations and look at who are the standout performers so far. If you recall, last week Aster and I put Tapu Bulu, Buzzwell, and Conkelder at the top of our list for Offensive Mon of the season with Halucha receiving a special mention. Of those Pokemon, only Buzzwool earned another kill in Week 2, so I'll keep Buzzwool on my list while dropping the others. There's three other Pokemon that I'm going to add to the discussion this week. Two were fairly consistent performers across Week 1 and 2, but the third has probably surprised many GBA fans in the early stages of this season. First, Landorus Eye of the Free State Tour Cats is proving that he is quite a threat whether or not he has his coveted Sheer Force ability. After getting three kills in Week 1, Cheeky Lando scored another kill versus the St. Louis Rampardos, and even though that doesn't sound like a lot, Duncan really played it masterfully. He brought the Landorus in on a predicted earthquake from the Terrakion, then expecting the switch out, Duncan clicked U-turn as Dan brought out his designated counter and Electros. That allowed Duncan to bring in the Marowak, which was able to nuke the Electros with a Flare Blitz, leaving Dan defenseless versus the Lando. The next time Terrakion was in versus Lando, Dan was forced to make a tough play and predict Lando's U-turn, but that was the turn Duncan revealed the Scarf on the Landorus, and he clean O-code the Terrakion with an Earth Power, removing Dan's biggest offensive threat. So in recognition of all the momentum that Landorus provided, he joins our candidates for Offensive Mon of the Season. Next, Volcanion of the Philadelphia Scissors has found itself near the top of the leaderboards with another two kills this week. Chimp set up the Volcanion really well, putting it in position to sweep late game versus the Latios and the Whimsicott. He played really patiently versus the Mamoswine with the Fortress. He could have gotten over eager and tried to Oko the Mamoswine with Gyro Ball, but instead he simply spun away the Sticky Web and set up Stealth Rock, which allowed Volcanion to outspeed the remainder of the team. Being able to get a poison on Pukimuku with Sludge Bomb was also a nice touch because it allowed the Doug Trio to come in and 2 it KO the Pukamuku. I still think Volcanion is sort of one dimensional, but that doesn't really matter when there are so few counters in the game to Volcanion. So I think it's safe to say we can expect it to be putting pressure on opponents all season long. Now, finally, this last Mon shocked everyone this past week by picking up a four Mon sweep versus the San Francisco Gigantes. Of course, I'm talking about Cobalion. This is another Mon that I'm sort of skeptical of because it doesn't have a tremendous track record of offensive potential in league format. But I have to respect the fact that it's leading the league in kills after two weeks. Crimson and the Detroit Steel Wings did a great job of identifying Geo's Ferrothorn set, which couldn't touch the Cobalion. That allowed Crimson and his Super War Lion to dance their way to plus four attack and plus two speed. Then they scored kills on that same Ferrothorn, then on Tapu Fini, then on Heliolisk and Umbreon. I'd bet that opposing coaches are taking notice and won't be sleeping on Cobalion anymore this season. Now, let's move on to the defensive bond of the season category. I'm still including Zapdos in the discussion as I think the marriage between Cooper and Zapdos is just too perfect to ignore. Cooper brought another substitute set which had a chance to finish off the game against Tom, potentially. It kind of depends on how long they wanted to play the stall game between P2 going for recover and Zapdos going for Roost, but it turns out not to have mattered all that much because the P2 did have the charge beam, and it proved to be too much to handle. I'll give Melodic and Newcomer Vaporeon a virtual tie for the next position, and also for being the most annoying bulky water type in Season 7. Melodic didn't do as well in Week 2 as it did in Week 1, but at the very least, it got a Scald Burn kill, and I'm sure this isn't the last time that Melodic's going to be frustrating. John's opponents as the season goes on. And Vaporeon, as I mentioned in the Game of the Week segment, dealt really well with Cooper's team, healing itself with Wish and phasing Pokemon into the match to take Rock's damage. Next, I am going to throw Mew into the mix here, as we've seen time and time again that coaches just simply cannot deal with bulky Mew sets. Mew was able to secure three kills in the late game versus Lars, and while one could certainly argue that Mew wouldn't have done that, if the Iron Tail from Lucario had hit, 
I think Mew is just too good not to include in this conversation. This is certainly not going to be the last time that we see Mew take on really strong, powerful threats, whether they're fighting types or whatever else. So that's going to wrap it up for the conversation on defensive Pokemon of the season. Finally, we are going into the coach of the season category. I do want to give a shout out to Callum Hoodlum Scrafty, coach of the Alola Athletic, for his hot start to his rookie season. He played Battler X like a fiddle this week and deserves some high praise for his prep and his general game sense. Going for Roar on the Como O and phasing out all the different Pokemon, setting up the rocks with the Dredagon after it lives on 1 HP, and netting a KO with a Rocky Helmet and Rough Skin damage was just too good. That being said, after seeing his dominating performance in Week 2, I really have to give my number one spot to Monatui, coach of the Tampa Bay Lux Rays. I just love how he played the mid-game and the late-game in his match. After Tup's Nidoking killed off Buzzwole, Mono brought in a Greninja, which can definitely Oko Nidoking with pretty much any water move that he wants to go for. But Mono, keeping the endgame in mind, recognized that the safer play was just to weaken the Nidoking and set up the conditions for a sweep with Scarf Roserade. The Cryagonal had already gone down, which outsped the Roserade, and Scizor, which is immune to Roserade Sludge Bomb, had already been removed by Buzzwole. So all that Mono really needed to do was put the Nidoking in range of a Sludge Bomb. And as played, funnily enough, the play that Tup made into Hydreigon actually robbed the Roserade of a kill, because Roserade would have 2 it KO'd the Hydreigon with Sludge Bomb. But after taking two Choice Specs Dark Dark Pulses, the Hydreigon died upon re-entry to Stealth Rock. So, kind of a bummer. Roserade might have gotten a mention in the Offensive Mono of the Season category had that not happened. But regardless, Mono had a clear game plan, he executed it well, and now he's sitting pretty with a 2-0 record. He is in a tough dis division, but Mono has proven that he is one of the toughest competitors in the GBA, and his team to boot is pretty stacked. I'm really eager to see what he can pull off between now and the end of the season. And that, ladies and gentlemen, brings me to the end of this video. I want to thank you all for watching, and as I said before this segment started, we will be returning to normal soon with all of our co-hosts and other guests. I hope you haven't minded the sound of my voice too much in the meantime. If you enjoyed the video, please make sure to leave a like, subscribe to stay up to date on all of the GBA Analyst videos, and please, please make sure to subscribe to all of our very talented coaches. My name is Choice CJ, and I will see you guys next time.